Hi, I'm Michael Smith. At Berkeley College, we're committed to educating the public about the importance of higher education and its impact on our communities. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by St. Joseph's Health, a passion for healing. It's what's inside us. Berkeley College, Suez, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 college savings plan, turn a dream into a degree. And by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is the Tisch WNET studio here in Lincoln Center. It is my pleasure to introduce Pumzili Mulambo Nunca, is executive director of UN Women and also the former deputy president in South Africa from 2005 to 2008. I want to thank you so much. And if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. You, you said in South Africa, there's a pronunciation that I missed. What is it? Yeah, Mulambo Nunca. 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 It's, it's the language that is spoken in the Black Panther film. Closer. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm one of the few people who really understand here in the US what they're talking about when they switch into vernacular. You, I'm going to ask you about South Africa, South Africa in, a, in a minute, a new president there as we do this program. But this initiative, UN Women, describe it. UN Women uh, is one of the agencies of the United Nations established uh, to address issues of gender inequality in the world relatively young, uh, seven years old, and uh, involved uh, in addressing issues of ending violence against women uh, all over the world, uh, women's economic empowerment and income security uh, for women. We help government pass policies mm. uh, that enable them to finance and fund uh, advancement uh, of women, whether it is providing schools that have got latrines so that girls don't stay at home because mm. of that, Sub subsidizing transport systems so that girls and children in general don't have to walk uh, 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 long ways. We also involve in women, peace and security all over the world. As you know, there's lots of conflict. We also involve in, in addressing challenges that we face in humanitarian settings. Uh, working alongside our bigger organizations that, that do relief, but we look at particular the issues that impact uh, on women in those uh, situations. So, I'm thinking about this, the Me Too movement right now, <clears throat> is it a worldwide thing? Is it a thing going on in the it's, United there's States? There's different versions uh, of it. It's not called Me Too all over the it world. It is not. It is not called Me Too all over the world, but it's good to have the Me Too as you, as you have it in the US, because it's got greater visibility. Media is much more strong and visible. And of course, the people that are associated with Me Too attract a lot of media, which is good, because then it profiles the issue. But women all over the world uh, have safe spaces where they come together and talk about uh, the experiences that they've had and seek remedies uh, together. What many women in the world have not been very successful in, which the Me Too movement in the US has helped with is holding the perpetrators accountable and ensuring that uh, impunity is addressed. And that mm -hmm. is a very important contribution that the Me Too movement is, is, is making. And the emphasis that it is time, time, time is up. Something, time is up. Something has to change. I think actually that is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that is in fact what Oprah Winfrey said in her speech that the time is up. Yes, no, absolutely. For those perpetrators. And that, that, that has uh, caught up, uh, you know, many people in the world are really addressing the fact that this, we cannot go on like this. There's enough evidence. We mm -hmm. know that there's a problem. 
We know that they are serial perpetrators Is and offenders. Oh, yes. 35% uh, of women in the world live with one form of violence. That's a lot. 35% of women. More than one in three. Yes. Some form of violence. Uh, some form of violence. And the, <clears throat> bulk it of it, the bulk of it is domestic violence, which means that it happens at home, which is supposed to be a safe place for a woman. Uh, it happens at work, uh, which is in the form of harassment by usually the more senior uh, person at the workplace. It happens in public spaces. Women experience gang rapes. Uh, it also happens in schools uh, for girls. Uh, and then you have other types of violence, such as forced marriages, where children marry men that are old enough to be their fathers and, or their caregivers. And you have uh, female genital mutilation. Uh, and then in areas where there's conflict, you know, you have all sorts of, you know, cruelty that is meted against women. Women who are refugees, uh, Syria, uh, women in... Human uh, trafficking Rohingya. involving women. S sorry? Human trafficking. Human trafficking of women and, yeah. and girls, it's, yeah. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's important to fight this comprehensively because it comes in different shapes and, and, and forms. Let me ask you this, you brought in this report. Mm. Yes. Turning promises into action, gender equality in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Talk about this. Yeah, you know, the governments of the world made a promise to each other and to the people of the world uh, to really work together to bring about far-reaching changes in the world. The aim is that this should happen by 2030, that we should uh, achieve substantive change for humanity. Uh, there are 17 goals that have been adopted around which uh, countries are working. One of them, goal five, focuses on gender equality, but actually uh, most of the goals uh, address issue of gender equality in one way or the other. Define, this gender, define gender equality. Gender equality is a, is, is a condition in society where men and women have equal rights, are able to enjoy those rights, those rights are protected, and there's no discrimination on the basis of gender. Equal education. Violence against women is the worst form of, uh, of discrimination and humiliation uh, together. Now, the issue is there isn't a, world, a, a country in the world that does not have gender inequality. Just the goal that is a goal for gender uh, in, uh, equality addresses some of the core uh, aspects of gender discrimination that we need to be fighting substantively along other forms of uh, discrimination. It addresses ending violence against women. It addresses mm. uh, women's participation because, as you know, there is no country where there's equal participation of women in decision-making bodies, in boards, in politics, in... Anywhere with power. And ev everywhere in the world. It, it addresses also the issue of uh, women and these cultural practices that are discriminate, right. discriminating mm -hmm. women, the most harmful one being those such as child marriage. But, you know, just gender stereotypes that perpetuate unequal pay. And, and before, I, I mean, before I let you out here, I want to ask you about South Africa in a minute. You were the, in fact, mm -hmm. the deputy president there. Mm -hmm. We have a role, men have a role in everything you just described. How would you describe that role? There is such a significant role for men. We actually have a campaign at UN Women. What can and should he we do? He for she. He for she, I'm sorry I can He for you. she. He for she. Where we expect and encourage men to demonstrate positive masculinity. To be fathers who are present in their children's lives and do it happily and visibly. Men who do not uh, beat up their their wives, men who actually also speak against colleagues in the locker room when they make uh, unacceptable comments about women and engage, men who will not look on the other side, men... At, we just don't at, turn the other cheek. Yeah, yeah. No, don't turn not the other... Not acceptable. Yeah, not acceptable. But also men who will, if they have power and influence, will ensure that where they have authority, they change regulations, rule, practices, so that there is fairness. You check in your treasury if women are paid equally in your place of work. That's a he for she. 
you make sure that uh, you recommend women to be on boards and you support them to get there. That's a he for she. One South Africa question. Um, you were there. You were there for it all. You yes. Know? Uh, Nelson Mandela and everything that he represented, not just there, but across mm. the globe. Mm. One thing about South Africa that is a misconception that many of us have that mm. you want to disabuse us of, mm. what would it be? What do we uh, need to know about you know, South Africa? And I will tell you something that he used to say himself, that people treat me like I'm a saint. I'm not a saint. I'm just a sinner who's trying. And you know what? Saints are boring, as he would say. <laughs> So he just was such a normal human being, amazing humility, yes. amazing sense of humor, and determination. Really determination wow. like you would ever believe. I was in his cabinet, and as a younger person, sometimes I would receive a message from him, like 4 a.m., and then you'd know the president is not sleeping. <laughs> My goodness, let me president jump. President Mandela was sending you a message 4 a.m. Well, you know, not just to me, but, you know, work-related. There's cabinet in the morning, and he <laughs> wants to clarify something before he goes to the meeting. And oh then, you know, gosh. the man is working. Why am I sleeping? I am half his age. <laughs> I better, you know, you know, be up and about and, and yeah. be productive. So it, and it's just quite inspiring to, yeah. to have a boss like that. Well, you're inspiring to a lot of people yeah. here watching on public television, Fios, and other places. And I want to thank you. Thank you. For joining us and yes. continued, uh, I don't want to say success, continue the fight over at the UN. And we thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, we'll thank right, you for having me. Oh, stay right there. We'll be right back okay. right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Drew Logan Powell, he's an actor in the dangerous book for boys, which is an Amazon series. Yes, it is. I'll describe it for folks. Uh, so the Dangerous Book for Boys is about like a family and we're mourning like our father's death and everyone's really devastated, but there's something that brings like humor to the family. Uh, so before the father died, he sort of wrote a book for the boys to help them grow up without him. And so basically, whenever the youngest brother Wyatt uh, opens the book, he goes into a whole fantasy world and it's really cool. What drew you to this? So. When I was like auditioning for this role, I really enjoyed like the character, and honestly, I had a lot of fun playing this dumb character. <laughs> is this <laughs> Dash? Yeah, this is Dash. He's the middle of the three brothers. Why do you use the word "quote unquote" dumb? So he's kind What's of the name? dumb jock. Um, yeah, that's us right there. Uh, I got to work a lot with Kain Zelensky and Gabriel Bateman. They're both very cool uh, kids, um, but. I use the word dumb because he's not very smart up there. Uh, he doesn't know how to pronounce the word gnome, doesn't really know what he's doing all the time, but it makes for good comedy, and that's what I really like doing. But this is very different from you. Very different. How would you describe yourself, your non-acting personality? Who are you? Uh, I've been told I'm very confident and I'm pretty smart, uh, but... Yeah, I'm kind of different from Dash in a little bit of ways. When did you know that, I always ask people when they come in here this question, and it's not always the same answer, which makes it fascinating for me. When did you know you really wanted to perform, be out there? So when I was four years old, it was Easter, and I was like walking around and like smiling for the cameras and like pretending I was a model and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Where? But, uh, I was in like my living room. Okay. You know, just hanging out with the family. And then, so I knew then that I really wanted to act and like be in front of the camera. So ever since then, I started begging my mom to let me do it. And for four years, she said, no, no way, not doing this. And eventually at the age of eight, so four years later, she finally said yes. And it's just. So now you're 12. So you've been only doing this for four years. Yeah. You wore your mom down. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to listen to you anymore. No. She knew you. this wasn't a phase or a fad. Yeah. It was real. Mm-hmm. How do you, and now you got this whole, by the way, Brian Cranston is in fact producing this series? He is, and it was so fun meeting him. He's such a cool, laid back guy, and oh, I learned a lot from him. Let me ask you something. That's a great shot. Boy, is he the 
just about the best. So what I'm curious about is, <clears throat> I'm often, you used the word confident before. And so I'm always interested in how adults and kids deal with the question of confidence. You get to go up for a part, no guarantees. A lot of, most people are rejected. Have you had to deal with rejection yet? It's much easier in this business to deal with rejection because they're not saying it straight to your face like, we're not taking you. You just don't hear back. So it's a little like nerve wracking, just waiting there, tapping your toes, like whittling your fingers. But eventually after a couple weeks, maybe you give up. But there's been times after a month, I thought no. And then all of a sudden I get a call back. So it's pretty easy at times to deal with that. But you were out on the island, you are born and raised on the island, uh, not Staten, but Long Island. Yeah. How, again, I'm from Jersey, so I was curious, New York always seemed so far away from me. Did it seem, as a little kid, <laughs> which you are now, but even younger, did New York City here in the heart of New York and also Broadway, a couple blocks away, did it seem really far away for you? So it kind of seems far, because like, as a young child, you're very impatient. So I would like, just like, kind of like wait in the car, just trying to get here. But now it's a lot easier, uh, cause like I have like a two hour drive. It's and you do your homework long. in your car? I do my homework, so um, it's so easy to catch up with the schoolwork if I miss it and stuff like that, cause I got that two hour drive all to myself. What kind of reaction have you gotten from the kids you've grown up with to your um, success? So I don't really like bringing it up, cause I feel like I'm bragging to them a little bit, but when it does come up, I have had kids that like don't speak for the next couple minutes and just like stare at me confused. What do, you, what do you mean? So they'll just be like so startled and like confused because like they've known me for maybe a couple weeks, haven't brought it up because yeah. I just feel like weird bringing it up, you know? But, but you're multi-talented in that you're also a competitive dancer. That is true. I, it. Um, so I dance on a competition team. And so basically I do a little bit of every style. I do funk styles, hip hop, acro, yep. Wow. Yep. <laughs> wow. So I do contemporary too. I did a little bit of tap. Uh, I did gymnastics for a couple years before I danced. And- Where'd you get the discipline to work as hard as you have to work to be as successful as you've been so far? So I love being in front of the camera, so, and like performing in front of people and people cheering for me. So I know if I don't put that whole effort in, maybe I won't get as many cheers. But if I don't get as many cheers, it doesn't bring a huge smile to my face, so. So yeah. you get the whole idea of having to work hard to get the opportunity to be out front. If you don't put the effort in, you won't get the good outcome, so. You should be a motivational speaker for kids. <laughs> Uh, listen, I, I, uh, can I plug again? Drew Logan Powell is uh, one of the actors in a terrific Amazon series. It is called The Dangerous Book for Boys. Uh, Georgette, this is from a book, right, of the same name? Right? Uh, and by the way, I also want to make it clear that uh, you come from Long Island originally. You got into this, just if you missed it before, four years old. He kept pressing his mom till he was eight, and then she said, okay. So a message to all the kids out there, um, be a pest and challenge your parents to do what you want to do. And sooner or later, if they're as serious as you are, they can be successful. Yeah. And you've been great. I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank you, young man. Be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're here at the um, Liberty Science Center. This is the annual gala of the New Jersey Sharing Network, their 30th anniversary, and they partner with hospitals in this life-saving effort. And I'm pleased to welcome my good friend, Daryl Terry, President and CEO, Newark Beth Israel Medical Center and Children's Hospital of New Jersey. Daryl, let me ask you, a night like this celebrating 30 years of saving lives, what does it mean to you? It's absolutely incredible. This organization, as well as the hospitals that support it, really transforms lives, saves lives, transforms lives. I really um, encourage everyone to participate in organ donation. 
it is so meaningful. We just recently had our 1,000th heart transplant celebration at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center, and the stories that you hear are absolutely incredible. There's one story of a, a young woman who received a heart transplant and within a year got pregnant and successfully delivered twins. And then had another child after that, because I interviewed her there. Yes, and as far as the donor's parents, the donor's parents are actually like the grandparents of these two, uh, of the twins. And so that's incredible because everybody feels good about it. You know, it was such a great night that Daryl's referring to. I happen to be uh, honored to interview some of the folks who were part of that evening at NJPAC. 1,000, by the way, it's 1,014, I think. 1,015. Uh, you got to keep up. And by the time this airs, it'll be more than that heart transplants. And, and just talk about that for a second. Dr. Victor Parsonet was one of the keys, talk about saving lives, changing lives. He was one of the leaders of that cardiac initiative, right? Victor Parsonet's grandparents actually founded Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. Victor Parsonet was the, did the first heart transplant in New Jersey at Newark Beth Israel in 1986. And so this 1,015 now would not have happened if not for his vision, without his leadership, without his clinical research. He is an amazing un humanitarian, an amazing philanthropist, amazing musician. So there's a Hall of Fame in New Jersey. And there is? Yes. And is he, he nominated? He is nominated. He's one of the 50 finalists. We have a lot of sports people and entertainers, and that's great, and they deserve to be there. But as far as medicine goes, Victor Parsonet deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. And there's a way we can get him in. But okay, we got to pitch. <laughs> we got to vote him in. We got to vote him in. RWJBH.org backslash VP and vote for Victor Parsonet. The other thing that uh, I know Daryl will vote for is the sharing network. Describe the connection between hospitals and the work of the sharing network because it's intimate and critical. We could not do the work that we do without the sharing network. They are absolutely amazing. They are in our building every single day of the week. They are encouraging families. They are talking to them. They are the most compassionate, kindest people, and they really make, they make it happen for us. There would be no 1,015 heart transplants without the sharing network. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. We're here at the New Jersey Sharing Network uh, annual gala. It's the 30th anniversary, and I'm honored to uh, welcome Jane Buckowitz. Um, and uh, your very close friend, Lynn, is with us. You have a very personal connection to the Sharing Network. Talk about it. Yes, I do. Um, my son, Dan, um, passed away in 2009 after a car accident. And uh, he was 21 at the time, and he became an organ donor. Um, that was our entree into the world of organ donation. And then um, in the last year or so, um, what's happened is with a little bit more free time, I've become very involved in working with this great organization, um, talking at high schools, um, in just different community events to raise the awareness about organ donation. Um, we're very proud of our son. And um, now that I've gotten to know so many organ recipients, um, I'm just so proud of the decision he made and how most of these people just live their life every day with, you know, an incredible amount of gratitude. And um, I know that he would be very happy um, to see what happened as a result of, of his gift. And speaking of, Dan, you were his godmother and 70 people helped. Talk about that. That's it. It's just it blows my mind. Um, what was he like? He was amazing, and I'll get emotional, but, you know, I knew him in, in Jane's belly, and we miss him terribly, but, like, I know he's made a difference. And he's making a difference. Yeah, it continues, and, and I see what Jane and their daughter Amy, they just have, like, healed through this process, and he, he just was... um. A kind, kind, smart, funny kid. And we lost him too early, but he made a difference. And he's continuing to make a difference. What would you say to all the families out there watching who haven't made the decision? I would say that um, I, of course, respect the fact that it's such a hard decision to make. 
but um, and and my son made that decision on his own, and he was 21. So we just had to stand by and watch the decision unfold. And I would just promise them that if they ever faced a tragedy like our family has, that this organization and and just the notion that your healthy child's organs do not get buried with them, they live on, and um, other people's lives continue to, you know, go on and make differences every day, you know, so it's so exponential, you know, what this means. I cannot thank you both enough and to your son who gave so much to so many. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by St. Joseph's Health, Berkeley College, Suez, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, turn a dream into a degree, and by Adler Aphasia Center, promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey, and by JerseyBites.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disorders in the U.S. Here in New Jersey, one in every 41 children is diagnosed with autism. And when a child is diagnosed with autism, every member of the family is affected. While there currently is no cure for autism, early detection and intervention can offer critical improvements for the child and tremendous benefits for the family. To learn more about autism, contact the Binder Autism Center at St. Joseph's Children's Hospital.